Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to a new video mini-series on spin locks. So in this first episode of the series, we're going to be covering the basics of spin locks and how we can implement them ourselves in C++. So fundamentally, a spin lock is a mutual exclusion device, meaning that we use it to prevent simultaneous access to some shared resource. And unlike other types of locks where, um, say when a thread is waiting for a lock, it gets put to sleep, with spin locks, we have the thread wait inside of a loop and pull the state of the lock waiting for it to become free. Um, the idea behind this is that if we're not waiting very long for the lock, the overhead of spinning inside of a loop and doing that polling is much lower than the overhead of context switching. But how exactly do we implement these locks in the first place? Right? So uh, at its core, we're going to need three main things for a spin lock. We're going to need um, some piece of state that says whether or not our spin lock is locked. We're going to need a method for locking our spin lock, and we're going to need a method for unlocking our spin lock. Right? So we can see a very basic example of this in this uh, naive.cpp, which we're going to improve upon um, in later videos. So our spin lock here is implemented as this class called spin lock. And it has our three core components, right? It has our state, which will be this std atomic bool called locked, um, which will be free, right, at initialization. Then we'll have a method for locking our spin lock called lock. And we'll have a method for unlocking our spin lock called unlock. Right. So for our state, we're using the std atomic bool here because um, we, we're going to have multiple threads trying to update this state at the same time. So we're going to have, say, two or more threads trying to do this read, modify, write of reading the state of the lock, trying to change the state of the lock, and write that out to memory. And what we don't want are those sub-operations to be interleaved from multiple threads in such a way where two threads both think that they grab the lock. Right? And so in order to prevent this, we can make this an atomic. That way that read, modify, write operation becomes one atomic unit. So that read, modify, write can't be broken up into the individual subunits. Right? All three have to complete together with nobody else interleaving, or it gets shot down. So none of it completes. Right? That way we can guarantee that only one thread can get the lock at any given moment. So the next thing we have in here is the uh, method for locking our spin lock. So this method of locking is where spin locks get their name, and it's going to be the central part of where we're going to apply most of our optimizations. So inside of here, it's pretty simple for a naive locking mechanism. All we have is an infinite while loop where we're doing this atomic exchange of whatever the current value is of locked, our std atomic bool, with true. And there's really only two scenarios that we have to think about in this situation. Um, so what is the case when we're calling lock and the spin lock is free and the case where we're calling lock and the spin lock has already been locked by another thread. Uh, so in the case where the spin lock is free, it's very simple, right? We just do an exchange of whatever the current value is of locked, which will be false if it's free with true. So that means our spin lock is now locked. It returns false, right? Because when our spin lock is free, the state of locked is false. So that means this turns into while false, and we just immediately exit out of the while loop, and we exit out of the lock method, right? So and it's fairly simple in that case. Um, in the case where the lock is already taken, so locked has already been set to true by, say, some other thread, um, it's still a fairly simple thing that goes on here inside of our lock method. So we still did the locked exchange of true, but now we're just swapping out true with the value of locked, which is also true, right? So we're just swapping out true with true over and over and over. So we stay in this while loop forever until some other thread eventually releases the lock and sets locked to false, right? So we're waiting for some other thread to um, release the lock. And speaking of releasing the lock, that leads us to our, our final method, which is um, our, a, a very simple uh, implementation which is for our unlock method, all we really need to do here is store false to locked, right? So we just need to set our, um, our state of the spin lock to false, saying that it's no longer locked. And that will go ahead and trigger every other thread that's spinning, waiting for the lock to become free, to go ahead and race and try to grab the lock at that point. So the unlock method is very simple. Where we're really going to be focusing most of our, our, our time as far as optimizations go, is changing the way that we're spinning and waiting for that lock to become free, right? But that's gonna be our basic implementation of a spin lock. 
So what are, what are we actually going to be benchmarking here to kind of test out our spin lock? Well, we're going to have every single thread run a very simple function here. It's just going to be this ink function where every single thread is going to get the same spin lock and the same uh, value, which is just going to be this int 64. And then every single thread is going to try to increment this int 64 100,000 times. And between each increment, they're going to grab the lock, increment the variable, and then unlock the lock. So we want to make sure that um, every single one of these increments gets counted. So we're locking in between each of these increments. Right? So we're modeling a scenario here where uh, we have heavy contention for the lock and the lock is not being held for a very long period of time. It's being freed rather quickly, right? Every single iteration of this loop, the thread locks it. It just does a single increment, then it unlocks the lock. So here we have our Google benchmark section, which is also you know, fairly simple. We just create the N64 um, value, set it to zero. We create our spin lock and then inside of our actual timing loop, so where we're actually going to take our measurements, we're going to go ahead and just create a bunch of threads and then uh, join the threads after they all complete. Okay, so let's go ahead and compile this and we'll go ahead and run it. So we'll use G++ for this. We'll turn on O3 optimization, mArch and mTune equals native and link time optimization, call the output naive. And let's go ahead and run it. We'll run it with perf record so we can look at the assembly afterwards. And so what we see is, you know, rather expected. You know, as we increase the number of threads, um, we're increasing um, the runtime by a significant amount, more than say, um, you know, double here. So even though we're only incrementing say 200,000 times instead of 100,000 times, when we move to two threads, right, the runtime explodes by say 12x, right? And the same thing goes for when we go from two to four threads, instead of increasing the runtime by say 2x, if we would have expected for say a single threaded um, application, it goes up by you know around 4x, close to 5x or getting towards 5x. And the same thing goes moving towards eight threads because we have all this overhead of competing for the lock and validating cache lines and having cache lines bounce around the processor. So let's actually look at the assembly to see how our spin lock looks at the assembly level. So we'll go ahead and do perf report and we'll go ahead and look at what our std thread, uh, so this is our lambda that's launching our ink function, and see what that looks like. And we, we see that it's fairly simple, right? So this is our kind of main loop where we're doing that for loop. So you see this 186A0 here, so that'll just be our 100,000, so the 100,000 times we're going through that for loop. We can see that our lock method has been inlined right here, and so it's fairly simple. All we're doing is doing this exchange right here. So we're exchanging to see if the lock is free yet. We're doing a test to see if we actually got the lock. If we didn't get the lock, we just jump back up and do another exchange. Otherwise, if we did get the lock, we fall through. We do the ink of that value, and then we just do another exchange to free the lock, right? So here we're trying to exchange true for false. And then here at the very bottom, we're exchanging false for true. We're just setting it back to the way it was, setting it back to the lock being free, right? We decrement, you know, our 100,000. So we've gone through the loop one more time. And then we just jump back to the top and do the entire process again, right? So right, right here's our, our lock loop. Here's our increment. And then here's our unlock right here, right? Fairly simple, fairly simple. Okay, so that's going to be the basics of spin locks and how we can implement them um, in C++, but clearly, you know, there, there might be some ways that we can improve this. So one of the problems that we're going to try to tackle next time is if we go ahead and look at perf stat here, and we look at, say, the heaviest contention case where we have eight threads competing for this lock, and we just print out some stats using perf stat dash D. If we go ahead and run this, we can see that we have a very, very high L1 decache miss rate. And what we're going to look at next time is an optimization called locally spinning, right? And uh, this local spinning will help with this L1 decache miss rate. And that will be the main topic of the next video. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. If you're interested in the code for this or any of my other series, they can be found at github.com slash coffee before arch. So if we go here to my GitHub page and we go under repositories, and then we go under spin locks. You can find this and all the other implementations in here. So we looked at naive today, and here's naive.cpp. But again, that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.